following lecture was produced by Glorian Publishing, a nonprofit organization, and is one of hundreds of lectures freely available via download, podcasts, streaming radio, and transcription. These lectures range in topic and complexity in order to address the many needs of humanity. We invite you to browse our library of lectures, books, courses, and articles to find teachings that suit you. Through the support of donations, Glorian Publishing has published 40 books, hosts international retreats several times a year, offers free online courses, and many other valuable resources, available to anyone worldwide. All of this has been made possible by the financial support of listeners like you. Your donations make it possible for this free public service to reach thousands of people every day. To make a tax-deductible donation in any amount, even anonymously, visit GnosticTeachings.org. Now, with heartfelt wishes for the end of suffering for all creatures, we begin the lecture. May all beings be happy. Samael Unveor often writes in his books that the being is the being and the reason for the being is to be the being itself. In our lecture today, we're going to see if we can understand exactly, maybe just a little bit more, what such a cryptic sentence means. We're also going to look at understanding with a little bit more clarity what the archetypes are. Throughout many of our lectures in the past, we mentioned this word archetype, and of course we're always talking about the being. And while we all probably have a, some, some conception of what the being is, some conception perhaps of what the archetypes are, there's often a lot of confusion. Even when we look at the tree of life, we look at the ten sephiroth. Sometimes we point to different spheres. Sometimes we point to the whole tree as this being the being. Sometimes we point to Hesed as being the being or the spirit. Sometimes we're pointing towards the absolute. So how can we understand all of these things? In order to understand what the being is and what the archetypes are, we need to start at the absolute because that is where everything comes from. Uh, Kabbalistically, as we know, there are three aspects to the absolute, which are the Ain, the Ain Sof, and the Ain Sof Aur. <clears throat> the Ain is the complete and total absolute abstract space. And from that, we have the Ein Sof, which is an abstract space, but already some kind of beginning. Samuel Anvior states that there's already some type of manifestation already there. For us, it's still a nothingness, because it's nothing that is in this existence. It's no thing of this existence so it is some nothingness. That Ein Sof is the root of our being. We say the being of our being. So really, that's the, where our real being is. The Ein Sof. And that is called a super divine atomic star. This is what Samael Anvior writes. He calls the Ein Sof a super divine atomic star. <clears throat> so, 
So in fundamental notions of endocrinology and criminology, he writes, the absolute does not know itself. The absolute needs to know itself. Each super divine atom needs to know itself in order to have consciousness of its own happiness. Unconscious happiness is not happiness. The human being in, its, in his last synthesis is just a super divine atom from the abstract absolute space. That atom is known by the Kabbalists with the name of Ein Sof. It is urgent to know that the Ein Sof sends its spirit to the world of matter with the purpose of acquiring that which is called self-cognizance self of its own happiness. When the spirit, after having passed through the mineral, plant, and animal states of consciousness, attains the human state, it can return to the Ein Sof to fuse with it. This is how the Ein Sof becomes conscious of its own happiness. So, that is a culmination of this whole existence. What is the purpose for our being? And you say the being, the purpose of the being is to be the being. But the, f the full capacity of its own being can only be with that full happiness, that full consciousness. So it's self-realizing its own beingness. So each of us is reduced to that super divine atom in abstract space. Each of us is reducible to a mathematical point in the infinite space and in the abstract space. That point represents the place where the ray of light emerges out of the absolute and that ray of light, through a process, unfolds itself into various forms in order to finally reach, it, reach this physical world. So the absolute is neither a human consciousness, and it's not a spiritual consciousness, it's not a divine consciousness. It is neither spirit, nor matter, nor energy. It is not light. We sometimes call it a negative light, or a chaotic, uncreated light. There's something there, but we, are un we don't have the capacity to see that light. Those beings which enter into those levels of the absolute consciously are able to see that light, work with that light. So, the Ein Sof is the root of the spirit, but it is beyond the spirit. Something beyond that. So, in culmination, the being is something that cannot be described. We could never accurately present it, whether in words or in symbols. But nevertheless... It unfolds itself. That point unfolds itself into many parts. In the infinite space, every point is the center. Because when there is a circle of an infinite radius, every point is equally distanced to the edge of that radius. So every point becomes the center. In that type of space, without the consciousness being developed, or without that realization, there's no way to know the difference between one point and another point. So those points of space, the Ein Sof, wanting to know about themselves, they project into the existence and that one point becomes many pieces, many parts. And all of those parts represent the being in different ways. All of those parts of the being arrive into existence 
in what we call the archetypes. So those archetypes are parts of the being. But the being needs to know itself. In a lecture called Christification by Samael Anvior, which is a very profound lecture, he stated, in the dawn of any creation, the sacred absolute sun breathes out the great breath, the very holy okedonok, or active okedonok. Yet this very omnipresent and omnipenetrating active ray of okedonok by itself could not create or perform any creation. It can penetrate within any cosmic unit that arises to life, but it will never remain seized or trapped by any cosmic unit. In order to be able to create, the great breath has to split itself asunder into three ingredients that constitute the holy triamatsikamno. The three primary forces create and create anew, yet if they flow in a dispersed manner, if they are not aimed at any given point, then they cannot perform any creation. But when they join at any given point in space, then creation is immediately originated. And in The Great Rebellion, he writes, we are mathematical points in space which serve as vehicles for predetermined sums of values. So those values are related to either the being or the ego. Or if it is the ego, it's the, that value of the being which is entrapped by the ego. So in the very first manifestation, the very first instant, the, the first instant of light, which is that chaotic, spermatic, phohatic moment of creation, from our experience, it would look like a chaos. From a paramata satya, or a cosmo creator, they might be able to make out the intelligence of that light, because they have what's called a diamond soul. And they are able to take that light and focus it into a point. Which is why I have some of these diagrams here of light being focused. If you have a diamond soul, you can take that light and focus it to see the intelligence, to see the organization. But if you don't have a diamond soul, you see nothing, you see chaos. In the same way, when we look at a precious stone, we cut it in certain ways. So when light goes in, it bounces off in a way that's very brilliant. So those beings which have a perfect soul, they transform that philosophical stone into a diamond soul. They have perfected it. They've perfected every atom of their being into a perfect diamond. And that light shines brilliantly in a, in a Vajrasattva. The completed Bodhisattva is a Vajrasattva. That word, of course, has many different meanings in Buddhism. I'm using it meaning the vehicle of a, of a consciousness, having a perfect diamond soul. So those beings that have a diamond soul can see in that light, in that first moment. And if they are paramatta satya, they can see even in the uncreated light. So there's different degrees. <clears throat> a monad, or an ain sof, that's projecting its spirit, or its monad, doesn't have the capacity to see that light. Doesn't have the capacity to do anything with that light. It could never direct that light into a point to create something. And yet, the only way that that, that monad can self-realize itself is it has to go into creation. So those monads need a helper. They need a cosmo creator. And we talk about seven fundamental cosmo creators. Well, the different types of cosmo creators that are helping. Because those cosmo creators can direct that light into a point in space in order to direct a monad into that point. So a monad that doesn't have a self-realization needs help to get into this universe. And also, those monads don't have the choice. They, they are forced to leave the absolute when the dawning of creation occurs. 
Because they don't, they don't have the right to, to sit in the Ain or the Ain Sof at that time. They get ejected. And the cosmo creators create everything, obviously. But what we are talking about now is that point in space, not uncreated space, but created space. Not three-dimensional space, but seven-dimensional space. That point in seven-dimensional space, which is our monad. In the tree of life, we point to, like I said before, Hesed as being our spirit. But we see that Hesed is not the top of the tree of life. The top triangle is Keter Hokmah Bina. And the Ain Sof, of course, is even above Keter. This is because a monad, unless it has incarnated the three primary forces, which allow that omnipenetrating ray to be directed into a point, the monad can't exist at that level with consciousness. It can only exist at the level of Hesed. So those cosmic creators create that point. They place that monad into creation, and that point is Hesed. They're taking the three forces, pointing at that into Hesed. So, the Ain Sof is a point in the absolute space. And Hesed is a point in the sixth dimension. So we say the Hesed is the spirit. Hesed is the being, because it is the being. But there's also a being of the being, which is the Ain Sof. Moving from Hesed, Hesed unfolds into many other Sephiroth. Because the spirit, like I said, wants to know itself. And it needs to unfold itself even more. It needs to split itself, in a certain sense, into parts. Without, when you, when you place yourself into parts, each part can relate to, its, to another part. When I observe myself... My consciousness is observing myself. There's, it's not a true split. I'm not saying you truly split yourself, but there is a division of attention going on. It's the only way that happens. Right? So when the being, the being necessarily must go into different parts or pieces, because this is an existence which exists only in parts and pieces. Nothing is uh, self-originating in this sense. It's always an interdependence of origination. But that light, which is that point in space, that flame, it unfolds itself into Gebera, and then into Tifereth, and Netzach, and Hod, and Yasod, and Malkut. We say that the, f- the first unfolding is Gebera, which we say is the spiritual soul. And we have said in the past that it's in the spiritual soul that the spiritual archetypes are placed. Now, there's another very profound statement by Samael and Vior, which is the following. The spirit is. The soul is something acquired. So, Hesed is. It's a point of light. Insof is. It's that, it's that point. But starting with Gebera and then Tifereth and everything down is something that's being acquired. All the experiences of being in this world are happening through, of course, has said, but Gebera and Tifereth and all, all of the lower Sephiroth are going lower and lower into the matter in order to gain experiences, in order to know itself. And knowing itself, you create karma or you create dharma. Hopefully, you cancel out both and you create self-knowledge. You develop. The thing that's being developed is that soul. And I said, in, in the end, that soul becomes a diamond soul with the point right in the middle, that point of light or that fire. 
that's irradiating out. It's that, it's that soul which has to be created. The spirit already is. The spirit doesn't know itself in totality. But the soul is what is that activity and the results of that activity which are going up to Geberah. Because, because Geberah is our spiritual soul. Below Geberah is Tifereth, which is our human soul. And when we talk about our human soul, we feel a little bit more of a relationship there because if nothing else, we have that essence of the human soul in ourselves. And we feel like, well, that's the activity that I'm trying to become conscious of, to be self-observant of, to be aware, and to be aware of. We act, we perform alchemical works, and those, the results of those chemical works rise up, and they rise to Gebra. They, they have the result in Gebra. But, of course, Tifereth and all of the lower Sephiroths are an unfoldment of Gebra. So saying that the spiritual archetypes are in Gebra is just saying that's where the all the manifestation is taking place. But it's also taking place in everything below it as well. Because Gebra unfolds everything else. <clears throat> Samayon Vior writes, It would be in no way possible to portray the being. It resembles an army of innocent children. Each of them performs specific tasks. The greatest longing of all initiates is to unify all parts of the being. This is written in the secret doctrine of Anahuac. But it's also written in the Pistis Sophia. It's written in other books as well. We need to almost imagine that picture the army of innocent children. Because that, that picture kind of eradicates this idea of a solid, of, of a just some old man in the sky or some simple representation. The being is something very sophisticated. The being could not be enumerated in all of its parts. It's too many. We could not put a name on each one of them. That's how many parts there are. We talk about some, a few basic archetypes we mention over and over again. And we also mention uh, the people of Israel being the archetypes. But we don't name each one because each is, is impossible to name them all. So just as we are made up of atoms many different parts, many different ways of, of um, organizing our own body, different organs, different parts of the body, different uh, collections of organs, organ systems, right? And we have molecules and cells, all these different ways of, 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 our being, of our body being put into parts. Something similar, we have to understand, is related with the being. And fundamentally, there are those ten parts which are the ten sephiroth, right? But there are many different ways to look at the parts, to organize the parts. Um, and like I said, we call of these different parts archetypes. What does archetype mean? Just looking at it from a, a word, it comes from archetypos, uh, which means... Arche means beginning or origin. Tupos means pattern, type, or mold. And pattern comes from the word pater or father. We think of these archetypes as primordial molds of the father. Ancient molds, ancient ways that that light is presenting itself. In the Mystery of the Golden Blossom... He writes, sexual energy contains within it the living archetype of the authentic solar man, which must take shape within us. It's a very interesting 
phrase there. Just as the first moment of creation, Samuel Enver calls it the sperma spermatic moment, the chaotic moment. We have a chaos within ourselves related to our sexual energy. And in that chaos are all the living archetypes. So those archetypes are in Gebra, of course, but physically, ele electronically, magnetically, molecularly, cellularly, they're, they're attached in our own body through different ways, through the chakras, through our glands of secretion, but most powerfully and most importantly through our sexual energy. So the, the living image or the archetypes are all there in the same way that if you have seeds in your hand, you place those seeds in the ground. And in the ground, in the matter, in the earth, you have all the chemical combinations which cause that seed to erupt out of the ground. And that seed being an archetype unfolds. That seed is a blueprint. That seed has everything in, in its essence to be that flower or that tree or whatever it is. All of those spiritual seeds are within us and linked, of course, physically to our sexual energy. That's where we have the capacity to direct those three primary forces. And it's through the sexual act, as we often state, that we are a living embodiment of a cosmic creator. We have a feminine and masculine principles, each having three brains, three forces coming together as a dyad, and unifying those, all those forces coming together in a single point. And that single point can create physically, but what we are interested in is transmuting that energy to release the light in that energy so that light goes back up or that archetype is nourished. So that energy breaks open that archetype and nourishes. And that <clears throat> the activity in Malkut activates the activity in the higher worlds. It causes activity in Gebra and Hesed. That is why there's a whole lecture called the Archeos, Archeos, that Samael and Vior has. There is a lot that Paracelsus wrote about that matter. And, you know, fundamentally, the archaeos is the alchemical mercury, everything arising from that mercury. And you work with the archaeos, you work with the mercury to, cr to create those mercurial bodies, the solar bodies. Really, the first thing that happens when has said is placed into the universe, other principles are placed as, as well, of course. Gebera, Tifereth, Netzah, Hod, Yetzod, and Malkut, they're all there. <clears throat> but they are not developed. So even those Sephiroth are simply seed elements of what they need to become. The individual who is using sexual transmutation, who is performing sexual alchemy, achieves, the first thing they achieve in that first initiation of major mysteries is a connection. There go. It's a connection. So you're working in Malkut, of course, but through sexual magic, a link occurs between Hesed and Gebra. Before that, of course there's a link there, there's a relationship there, obviously, but a conscious link is occurring there. So that is how the monad becomes what's called a master monad. Not a master on earth, but in heaven, in the, of the first degree. And that is when that light and that soul are finally united in a first, in a first sense. 
That's why we, we talk about, or, or Blavatsky says that uh, Atman, which is Hesed, is like a flame of prana that is burning inside a bowl of alabaster and holding that, that flame. So through the first initiation, the person who's working is developing those archetypes. Of, it's almost you're, you have to first develop the very structure of your soul, which are archetypes. And then when it's, once your soul is developed in that sense, then more archetypes can be freed. We'll go into that. There are, as I said previously, there are an infinite number of archetypes. But there are just a few that I want to mention. Because we always are talking about them. Uh, the first being the Divine Mother. The Divine Mother is that very Ein Sof or abstract space in it, at the root. The Divine Mother is that capacity of, a, of a generating something, a creative activity of space. We say that there's five fundamental aspects of the Divine Mother. In reality, the Divine Mother can manifest itself, herself in an infinite number of aspects. But the left side of the Tree of Life, which, I'll bring up the picture, the left side is more related to the Divine Mother. Why is that? We say, firstly, the Divine Mother is the unmanifested Kundalini or Mula Prakriti. It's a Divine Mother space. <clears throat> then through the, in the Logoic world, in the Supernal Triangle, the Divine Mother related to Bina, which is when the three primary forces polarize in a masculine sense and the three primary forces also polarized in a feminine sense. And then they unite. The individual, particular Divine Mother, is that feminine aspect of those three primary forces. And then we have the Divine Mother Death, which, of course, the, the Divine Mother Death can manifest itself in any Sephiroth, but most particularly we would say in Geberah. Terror of love and law. Then related to Yesod, the instinctive elemental female magi. And then related to Malkut, we have individual particular divine mother nature. <clears throat> so their individual particular divine mother nature gives us our instincts. So when we say we need to develop a connection with our Divine Mother, we have to understand that Divine Mother is, is something that manifests in various different levels. You could, have a man, you could have a manifestation in the world of Bina, or a manifestation in the world of Gebra. You know, for example, so <clears throat> we're talking about the archetypes when we have an experience, a mystical experience, or a dream, or an astral body, what we see in front of us are symbols. Those symbols, of course, are archetypes. Right? The different ways that that light is symbolizing itself. So when we uh, try to interpret our dreams or try to comprehend an experience in the inner worlds, we need to look at it from that aspect of the archetypes. That... What is going on there is a representation of our own being, of our own soul, or something we need to understand. But it's presented to us in the language of the being. Is the language of the being are the different archetypes, those different symbols. 
Sometimes we say the 22 letters, I'm looking, about, I'm looking at Kabbalah, the 22 letters of the Hebra um, Kabbalistic alphabet, those are 22 archetypes. Right? All the cards of Tarot are archetypes as well. So if the 22 letters are archetypes, or the, or the runic letters are archetypes, we know that even our letters, modern letters, are watered down archetypes as well. So every word that we create, every word that we speak, is something of a watered-down archetype. Every word I say is a symbol. More profound symbols are symbols related to the, the, the language of gold or the symbolic language of the being. The way the being speaks is in that symbolic way. We speak with, with symbols, which is language. But our language is very pale, and very superficial. It takes a lot of words. It's very subjective. Objective language is the language of the being, is those experiences, which in a single experience can transmit or communicate something that could never be communicated with our very flimsy words. It's a very flimsy way of communicating. So when we as students get frustrated with the, those types of experiences when we want the, those experiences to just be explained to us in words, we are missing some, we're missing a comprehension there that the words, if we were to just get a bunch of words from our being, that would, wouldn't convey the message that the being is trying to convey to us. Obviously, the being can, even, can speak and you can have a conversation as well, but the profound things that we need to learn are symbolized in different ways because they, they, they reach us at a very deep level. <clears throat> so for example, I found myself, I had an experience related to my Divine Mother. And I was approaching, I was walking down a dock, so below me were waters. And I was approaching a woman who was representing my Divine Mother. And she was decapitating and cleaning these small bodies. Very gruesome. And she, had a, she had an apron on, it was very bloody. But she was doing that with a tremendous peace on her face, tremendous love for what she was doing, even though it was a very dirty work. And of course, she was separating the blood and the guts from the bones very peacefully. So what that was representing was the refuse of subjective values or aggregates and the bones, the bones being the archetypes which are necessary. And liberating the energy. When you liberate the blood, you're liberating energy. <clears throat> so that was very profound. But I proceeded past her, and I continued walking down that dock. And those waters were becoming more pure, more crystalline. And at the end of that dock was a very, very immaculately beautiful lake. And on that lake were enormous swans swimming. And those swans came near me and allowed me to they were so large I was able to stand on them and they took me into that lake so there we can see very obviously that was two separate aspects of the Divine Mother one being related to Divine Mother death and the other one being related to Bina, the Holy Spirit, is the swan, the great bird of white plumage, 
sometimes represented as a dove of white plumage, is related to the Holy Spirit. And those immaculately clean waters was related, obviously, to the upper waters. So that experience, something very profound, but nothing that is special. Because that experience is what happens if you place this doctrine into activity. Something like that. Right? So any, any person has the capacity to have a, that experience. That is our right. That is the point. But those symbols represented something to me which could never be communicated by words. And I hesitate even explaining it because I distort it. But I believe it's helpful that we can have those experiences in relationship to different parts of our being. The being is trying to show us. It was very interesting because I was attempting, I was meditating on my own being. Meditating, wanting to know, what is my being? What is my being? And I had that experience. But when I came, when I remembered it, I was still frustrated. And I kept asking, what is my being? What is my being? Meanwhile, that was a representation of the being. But I wasn't prepared to understand the being like that, as being symbols. Because even if the being came down as a person, that person is just a symbol as well. That person is a symbol of that infinite point in space and the way that the fire and the light is transmitting in that moment. <clears throat> so when Samael Unvio writes that the being is like an army of innocent children, we have to really reflect on that because that is what the, the being could be any of those things. You could have, for example, um, an experience where I saw a paradise, a, a, a very a, a, a garden, and in that garden were. A, all sorts of people, but they're, they were all wearing lab coats. They were all physicians. And there was all sorts of cows there. And again, so what, did I was, what is my being? I want to know what my being is. But that was a representation of my being. It's particularly related to the Holy Spirit because the phys great physician is the Holy Spirit. But there wasn't just one. It was all of these physicians. And it wasn't just one cow, it was all these cows. And it was, it was very confusing to me. But after more meditation, I see, well, that was a representation of my being. <clears throat> the other archetype I just wanted to highlight is Lucifer. And when we talk about Lucifer, we also have to talk about Christ. And we've had numerous lectures about Christus Lucifer. And again, in the secret doctrine of Anahuac, Samael and Vior writes, Zoltol Lucifer is not in any way a foreign personage, personage separated from our psyche, but rather, Lucifer is certainly the shadow of our own divine being within our own particular inner depths. <clears throat> so in the final synthesis, Christ and Lucifer are united. That's why we say Christos Lucifer. But when the being is coming down and has all these different parts, how is it that those parts are going to become self-realized? We need... Lucifer to give us the resistance. We need Lucifer to tempt us. This is why Samuel and Vio writes, um, fire is temptation, but, temp but uh, triumph over temptation is light. So Lucifer, as we always say, is uh, lutz or lux, light, and fur. means to carry, to ferry, the carrier of light. And related to fire as well, related to temptation. 
And Lucifer is known throughout all of the temptations, but most, most particularly, most importantly, related to sexual potency, related to sexual temptation. Because that's, again, that's, that's, where our, that's where our fire is. That is where we need to create the light. That's where we need to work in the forge of Vulcan. That's where we need to temper our metallic elements, and purify our metals, purify the mercury, and saturate all of our inner, our, our, our inner uh, Hod and Netzach and Tifreth, which create the astral, mental, and causal bodies. We only have them as phantoms, as, as uh, related to our ego. As ele- even if we didn't have an ego, we would, only, we would have something there that was an elemental, protoplasmic type of element, like a placeholder on an elemental level. But we have to take, take those points and saturate them with our own inner light. We do that through sexual transmutation. But without the resistance, without the temptation, you can't have the light. That's how you know good and evil. What comes to my mind when I think about creating light, I think of a light bulb. And we'll talk about the old style light bulbs with just the filament in it. We screw the light bulb in and and electricity goes through it. And that electricity causes light to appear. But atomically and electrically, something's happening for the light to appear. Because we can pass electricity through something, it doesn't mean light's going to come out of it. Light is generated, photons are emitted from the filament because there's a resistance for the electricity to move, to move through it. And so the electricity, the metal is there, the, the metal filament, that's a little piece of wire in the, in the light bulb. It's there, it's a metallic element. It's a good conductor of electricity because of the way uh, a metal is atomically organized. So it passes electricity through it. And what's the electricity? Electrons. By the way, Samuel Unveor says that uh, Devi Kundalini lies sleeping within the electrons. So the, ele- so the electricity passes through, so there's a flow of electrons. But the, even though it's a good conductor, the electrons don't just pass through completely freely. There's, an, there's a resistance. It's not a perfect conductor. The atoms, they have a nucleus, right? And then they have electrons around it. I, I should have put a picture of it up. Um, the way that the electrons always orbit, they have different shells. It's quantized. So you're either at a lower shell or you're at a higher shell. There's no in-between. You jump to a higher one or you go to a lower one. So when, you get, when that electricity passes through, the atom gets, this, gets energized and jumps, an electron jumps to the higher level for a moment. But because of the way the, the forces all work, is the, the atom only has a certain number of protons and there's other properties that the atom then takes that energy and spits out a photon and spits out heat as well so that the energy level of the electron could pop back down to where it likes to be. And the result of that, of that energy level going back down is a photon emits into space, and that's where we get light. <clears throat> Something very similar is happening when we go through a moment of temptation. We are getting charged with energy. Most particularly, we can see this, of course, sexually. We get charged with sexual electricity. Sexual, being sexually aroused. We say that Lucifer is the energy. Lucifer is the capacity for us to become sexually aroused. Without Lucifer, we could not have sex. So Lucifer is necessary. But what do we do with that energy? Normally, we burn the filament. Because if, if, the, if those atoms didn't have the capacity to push the energy level back down, energy would just accumulate in the filament. And it would burst. So it's, it's taking that energy and transforming it back down and transforming it into light. So in those moments of temptation, we have to transform that energy. 
And when we transform that energy in the right way, we're transmuting that energy. We're transforming that energy so that we release the light. And that light is that, that consciousness or that knowledge or the development of that archetype that's going to be deposited in Geberah. So Lucifer is the one that tempts. And he tempts all the parts of the being. So Lucifer is our best friend, but also our worst enemy. Lucifer and Christ, they cooperate in their antagonism. They antagonize each other in order to cooperate in the self-realization of the being, in order to save the souls. So Lucifer will always tempt, but without, because without temptation, there's no light. Uh, without a resistance, we can't build the diamond soul. A diamond is the same fundamental atoms of, of some carbon. But the carbon goes under heat and pressure and intensity for a long time. And all of the atoms um, integrate in a crystalline pattern which forms a diamond. It's the same thing with the being. The being has all these parts but it's not, it hasn't been crystallized into a diamond soul yet. It hasn't, doesn't perfectly transmit the light. A diamond soul perfectly transmits the light of the spirit, the light of the being. And that perfect transmission, uh, you know, Lucifer has nothing more to do in that respect when the, when the diamond soul is created. Now, beyond these two, we, we could, of course, we could talk ad nauseum forever about different archetypes. And in every lecture we give, we're usually talking about one or more archetypes. Right? All of the disciples, all of the personages in, in all of the religious texts are different ways in which the soul is interacting, the spirit is interacting. <clears throat> but I wanted to talk about the Old Testament uh, patriarchs, uh, principally Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Because they represent archetypes which are Hesed, Geburah, and Tiferet. So, Abraham is originally called Abram, and it said he comes from the city of Or. U R, it's usually stated. Or. This is Kabbalistic. It's coming from Aor. It's coming from the light. So Abraham, or Abram in this sense, is coming down from the light. Coming down into Hesed. And all of these patriarchs have multiple wives. We have to understand that those multiple wives are also archetypes. That uh, we are not um, trying to teach polygamy or anything like that. The multiple wives are in two categories. One category are wives that are servants, or sometimes called maid servants or concubines, and then there's their true wife, so to speak. Um, and you'll see it's repeated in different levels, and Abraham and Sarah, Isaac and Rebecca, and Jacob and Rachel, which then Jacob has another wife called Leah, when he's called Israel. Um, those different wives represent what is being created in the soul, what is being created, because there's a lot of mistakes that are, that are being uh, fulminated, um, where there are offspring, that offspring is our mistakes, the offspring is related to nature, uh, being a slave of nature. So I won't go into all those details, but if you read these stories or if you look at some of the other lectures related to the Kabbalah of Genesis, you'll see how that's all related. So as I said previously, if you have seeds in your hand, it's one thing for those seeds to be in your hand. It's another thing for those seeds to be in the earth. And it's another thing for those seeds in the earth to germinate. Three different things, right? All of them have to happen. So first the seeds have to come from the absolute and they have to go down. And that's a process. Uh, and only when... We can say only when the soul is developed can we really begin to work with all the archetypes. Before the soul is developed, we're working with the archetypes to build the soul. 
But when the soul is developed, then we can work with all the archetypes. What does that mean? That means that the lineage of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob are these activities that are happening in lower, lower levels. So Abraham and Sarah, first are called Abram and Sarai. And then when Abraham is 99 years old, he receives the name Abraham. And Sarai becomes Sarah. And they say that there's a child on the way, which is Isaac. So 99, of course, then he becomes 100 years old, as we know in the Old Testament, every 100 years represents an, an initiation of major mysteries. So, and that, and that H is the He, Yod He Vav He, which is the uterus, the divine womb. So, when you reach 100, you get that divine womb. You're creating a spiritual, um, something spiritual within yourself. Isaac is the outcome in that sense. Um, so that's the initiation, that's the first initiation of, of uh, major mysteries. And then there's Isaac and Rebekah related to Geburah. Again, many things go on. Uh, Jacob and Esau fighting. Uh, but then Isaac and Rebekah have a child named Jacob that's related to Tifereth. So again, we're descending. Uh, these are all conscious works that are happening. So an initiate working in Malkuth and of course in the superior worlds as well, but has a physical body going through the initiations. Not only is, is he developing the solar bodies through those initiations, the being starting with Hesed and Gebra. Let me get the... So beginning with the first initiation of major mysteries, Hesed and Gebra connect. And of course, then the second... Gebra and Tifereth connect. And then Tifereth and Etzah with the third, with Hod and Etzah. You, you, so you can see how a line has to be traced for all these connections. It's not that there wasn't a connection there before, but it's becoming active. And at the same time, the initiate is achieving those initiations and creating the solar bodies going up. So the being is getting a level of integration going down. And the soul, or the human soul, is getting is building those bodies which are going up. This is happening simultaneously. This is why the being needs us as much as we need the being in this sense. If the being doesn't work with us in the right way, doesn't motivate us in the right way, and we fail, and the being by in accordance also fails its own work. So that's why there are these, these three patriarchs related to the the monad, Atman Budimanas. And then Jacob, as we spoke about in other lectures, of course, fights a strong angel and that he defeats that angel. We say in synthesis through sexual transmutation. And then he becomes Israel. And Israel, uh, the wife related to Israel is Leah. And Israel has 12 children, or we could say in Genesis there are 12 tribes in Egypt because Jacob has four different wives. Um, but those 12 tribes of Egypt are related to the archetype of 12, the 12 uh, zodiacal signs. We see the 12 apostles of Jesus. It's the same 12. A way that, a way that all of these infinite, we can say, parts of the being are organized. In one way is the 12. Um, so, of course, with Israel, there's many children, but there's Benjamin and Joseph related to the astral body. Again, there's a development related there. Joseph gets enslaved by the Egyptians. So then at this point, when Joseph gets enslaved by the Egyptians, and we started to talk about Moses, the individual who is working at the level of Moses has reached the... has. Uh, is at the fifth initiation. So Moses is that willpower related to Tifereth, the human soul, fully developed. Now the human soul can take all of the Israelites out of Egypt, which means all of the archetypes out of the ego and synthesis. <clears throat> so 
So in the New Testament, of course, we, we can kind of continue on because the New Testament, it talks about the path of John, and John is the one who prepares the way for Jesus. So again, John is related with the human soul again. But Jesus is the archetype that's very high up, that's going to save the soul and the God. This is why Samuel Allen Vior says that, that uh, Master Abramento came to save not only human beings, but gods. Because we, our soul has to be saved, but our monad, our spirit, also has to go through a transformation as well that needs, the, needs Christ. It needs that Christic element. So Jesus, or the Savior, a Yeshua, is an archetype, but very high. So the ones who are directly working with that archetype are the ones who are on the direct path beyond the fifth initiation. <clears throat> And we can say also, in the Pistis Sophia, Sophia, of course, is an archetype. And a very similar um, drama of Sophia descending from the 13th Aeon, which is the Ain, and going down and mingling with the impure light, mistaking the pure light of the Absolute with an impure light and the archons oppressing Sophia and Sophia has to go and do 13 repentances. So Sophia is liberating the archetypes out of every aeon as she goes up. So just to give a sense of what's, you know, just to give a sense of what it means that beat that Army of Innocent Children, uh, if you read the Pistis Sophia, you will find many, many different uh, ways in which the being is, is spoken about, where Jesus is talking about all these different powers and gods relating to Sophia. But all of those powers and gods are all related to the being. Even the archons, even the rulers, even the tyrant gods that are oppressing Sophia are still related to the being. And that is something we have to comprehend. It's difficult. So in the Pisces of Sophia, there are archetypes such as Yehu, the good, Sophia, of course. You have the three gates, the three amens, the four winds, the five leaders, the five helpers, the five impressions, the six aeons, the Yabroth, the seven a.m., the seven amens, the nine guards of the great treasury, the twelve apostles, twelve saviors, the twelve light powers, the twenty-four elders, the twenty-four invisibles, the forty-nine powers, the forty-nine fires, all the tyrant gods, all the rulers or archons of the aeons, rulers of the fate, rulers of the sphere, and the guardians of the aeons. Well, this is all culminating into an army of innocent children. So when, if you were to read the Piss of Sophia, you might get confused because it's talking about so many different things, so many different powers and archons, and it's, it's confusing. That's why if you are attempting to read that, you have to meditate and very slowly go through that book. And the one who is only really going to comprehend that is the one who is on the direct path, because that that's a direct path teaching. We can, we can read it and study it, and we should, but the one who's living it is the one on the direct path. So, in synthesis, it's our duty as the human soul to die within ourselves. And it is our duty to become conscious of ourselves and to integrate all the different parts of our being. There are masters who have integrated some parts of their being, but not others. And Samael and Vior states that it's very rare to find someone who has achieved total integration of all the different parts of their being. There are monads that achieve very high levels, a very well integration, but they remain limited by all of the infinite possibilities of existence because they haven't perfectly integrated and self-realized all the part of their being they are unable to enter into the abstract, absolute space 
the 13th aeon, which is the Ayin. So do you have any questions? Good question. So the uh, divine mother death is Kali. Yeah. So that so in other traditions in Hinduism we have we have a wife of all sorts of different gods, and that's the divine mother in many different ways. And Kali is definitely the divine mother death. We, in a Western point of view, will see a picture of Kali uh, again with a big bloody sword and a and a skirt of skulls standing on top of you know someone and think it's some kind of terrible picture. But we know the true essence of that is, is that it's Kali decapitating the ego, liberating that blood, that essence, that energy, so it can go up. Unfortunately, some people do worship Kali in a very negative way. So that there is that type of, um, that type of worship. In any, in any tradition, there's going to be a worship of, of uh, the ego, we'll say in synthesis. So yes. Uh, the other question I had was, um, is resisting temptation necessarily the same thing as celibacy? Is resisting or temptation. temptation? We'll say about celibacy that there are two types. There is the individual who is rejecting sex and the individual that's working to transform sex. Unfortunately, throughout, the, throughout history, religion has degenerated and there's still a teaching about sex, but all that, is, all that remains is that you must refrain. You must become celibate. But that teaching, unless there's something more behind it, that teaching is incomplete and will, and will never work. There needs to be a doctrine of transmutation. You can refrain from, from, from sex as, as a physical act, but you must transmute, you must work with that energy. That energy, if it's not worked with, can actually harm you. It will harm you. It will, harm, it'll, it'll become like a piece of fruit that's rotten. Because you haven't, you haven't, you know, if you sit a piece of fruit on a table, eventually it, rot, it, it, it rots. So we need to work with our own tree of life, our own uh, golden apples, so to speak. But if we don't work with, if we just completely refuse any sexual expression, I mean, we don't perform pranayamas, we don't uh, do certain types of exercises that will transmute sexual energy, that energy just sits there stagnant, and then it begins to become poisonous for us. Uh, Gurdjieff calls them post vibrations, poisonous vibrations, and they can cause us to really degenerate our mind because our sex and our mind are always related. Chastity awakens our mind. Uh, fornication or a, a uh, incipient or uninformed form of celibacy will actually degenerate our mind. And we can become a cynic, an expert type of skeptic. Um, there's other ways that, that it degenerates the mind. So what we have is we need to work with sexual energy in some way. Now, not everybody has the opportunity to work with a partner in marriage, but, the, but to work with sexual energy, like I said, there's, there are ways to transform that energy as a single person. And that's what's important, that we work with that energy. Because even if we're just working with ourselves, again, through pranayama, through mantras, through um, the sacred rites of rejuvenation, through our runic exercises, through certain devotional type of acts, that's working with the energy, the creativity. So we're liberating it, and we're being very healthy. It's, it's making us healthy. The individual who just refuses it and tries to shut, the, uh, shut sex down into, into try to turn it off, it, it's absurd. It doesn't make sense. So is Tantra a remedy for that? Right. So Tantra, uh, of course, is a huge topic. But when we talk about Tantra in terms of sexuality, yes, because Tantra is the continuum of energy. That's what that word means. Tantra means continuum. How do we work with the continuum? Well, the sexual energy is the root energy of our whole existence. I mean, we have emotional energy, intellectual energy, physical energy, but it, sex is where, that, where, where it really hits us. 
most powerfully. So yeah, tantra, tantrism is, is the way through that. Absolutely. Any other questions? Okay. Absolutely. Good question. So I didn't talk too much. I didn't say the word monad very often in this in this lecture. So the monad it's a word that means unity. Monas, mono. You know the word monad means a unity. The monad on the tree of life is Hesed, Gebra, and Tifereth. Atman, Budi, Manas. <coughs> It'd be more accurate to say that the monad is expressed through those three. Because the real root of that monad is in the Ain Sof. But if we were to say that the monad is, is Hesed Gebra Tifereth, then it would, it would be accurate. So anytime I was talking about that triangle, or Atman Budi Manas, I was talking about the monad. So we have the monad, and then we have the supra monad which is related with the top triangle. And it's the same way of saying we have the being and we have the being of the being. Or another way, lots of terms, we have the monad and the glorion, which is related with the top triangle. Does that answer your question? Each Sephiroth? Yeah. So why is it, why is it so specifically? <clears throat> it's those three specifically because it's the, f it's the first reflection of the uh, three primary forces. So the three primary forces, sometimes a way to think about this is that these, this upper triangle is actually inside has said but we we blow we expand it the first moment of the ray of the ain't so far coming out is indifferentiated omnipresent light everywhere because the three primary forces haven't been created yet so you can think of a room where it's so bright you can't see anything because the light is everywhere all at once. And this is why in the lecture he says, uh, Samuel on Vior says that three forces have to be created in order to take that light that is everywhere and point it into certain points to create it. So that's why we have these the three primary forces creating this first creation is this spiritual triangle, basically. So, just different unfoldments. We have the, the supernal triangle, which is the top one, representing the cosmic common forces. Those cosmic common forces are necessary to create the rest of the tree. The first thing it creates is Hesed, the spirit. So that's, that's the spirit there. And the spirit, of course, is going to manifest as a triangle, as three things, a spirit, a spiritual soul, and the human soul. Then we get a third triple light power, as Pisces Sophia calls it. There are three light powers. A third triple light power, which is Netzach, Hod, and Yesod, which is another reflection of that three. And that third triangle in Tiferet is, this, is the soul. So you have the the Christ is the top triangle, the spirit is the middle triangle, the, the soul starts in the middle triangle as well, but then the soul is related to the third triangle, especially. I don't know if that answered your question, but... Okay, you're welcome. So if Lucifer is a reflection of uh, the being, is, does that mean that Lucifer is also a multiplicity? That's an excellent question. <laughs> If Lucifer is a reflection of the being, then Lucifer must be reflected in that multiplicity. 
Yes. <laughs> we have the ego, right? So it's interesting. We're talking about multiplicity in many different parts. We're also talking about the doctrine of many eyes, many egos. Why is that we are a multiplicity of egos? It's because each at the core or the seed of every ego is that archetype. But we have a false light around it, a false creation. Uh, so the multiplicity in Lucifer is that ego. There is also a type of false light that can be occurring that is not related to the ego, related to higher parts of the being that are not completely integrated, but they still antagonize other parts of the being that are still not totally objective yet. So the ego is one level of us being trapped and in bondage. But then when you get rid of the ego, there are other works related to higher levels that are trying to purify that light. Yeah? Um, back to the momentum. Sure. The, the monad only has one human soul. However, there's also another type of terminology where we, we can say we're, made, we're composed of billions of monads, which people have get confused about as well. But those billions of monads are actually the archetypes themselves. But what we can say, though, is we have one human soul, which usually relates to one physical body. Our unique individuality is our being, is our hesed or atman, or we can go all the way to the end self and say that's our unique individual being. That's, that's our individuality. But our true individuality, our true being, is a multiplicity, is a, is a cosmic unity with all other beings. So there are different ways, and the mind can get very confused about this. So we have our being as an individuality in hesed, if our being as a multiplicity within all the other individualities within a supernal triangle, this top triangle. So that the person who meditates can, can elevate their consciousness to this triangle, because this triangle represents all the common forces. You can then enter into the experiences of, some, of another monad. So Samuel Anvior writes about experiencing himself um, I can't remember if it was John the Baptist or Jesus, but he was able to meditate because you elevate yourself to that level. That level is connected to everything. We're all as one. And then you can then descend into the lived experiences of the past of, of another being. So we, are in, we have our individual being. We have our cosmic universal being. And then we have our non-being, which is in the absolute. And Samuel Onvior writes that our true being is a non-being. Our, uh, we have, uh, this is the, the difference between the Atman and the on atman you know. In the last synthesis, it is not a beingness, it's a non-beingness, which is our real being. You know, like that type of meditation we have in an abstract space. So there are different levels, if that makes sense. Yeah. Is it only a bodhisattva who can experience, who can experience the Can you repeat the beginning of the question? Is it only a bodhisattva who can experience meditating on reaching that level? And no. Any, anybody who, who practices meditation can reach any level of tree of life. They need to become proficient in meditation. Now, it's one thing to go there as a simple elemental consciousness, which would be probably most of our cases, we could elevate ourselves to that level and we would be like a fly buzzing around the light bulb, you know, or something like that. Now, a bodhisattva might have their center of gravity there and they are fully developed there and they have full capacities. So, anybody can reach these levels. It's just our center of gravity changes and goes higher and higher as we develop. So somebody who is a bodhisattva, elevated bodhisattva, has to concentrate in order to be here. 
physically, whereas we have to concentrate to go up. But they have a lot more, they have total free will, so they can, the concentration is not as difficult. But that's, certainly that's what they have to do. To learn more about what you learned in this lecture, we invite you to explore the books published by Glorian Publishing, available from booksellers worldwide. You may also be interested in online courses or upcoming retreats, all of which you can learn about at GnosticTeachings.org. All of this has been made possible by the financial support of listeners like you. Will you help others to benefit from this knowledge? Most spiritual schools recommend a donation of $10 to $20 per lecture. Every donation helps. Make a donation now at GnosticTeachings.org. Thank you. May all beings be happy. Thank you.